Today, we hear of remnants and fools and God's wisdom and tenderness. And in our gospel, the Beatitudes, we hear what Jesus thinks God thinks is the most important. Our readings from the prophet Zephaniah and the letter to the Corinthians challenge our day-to-day -day assumptions as they were meant to do in their own time and place. The sayings of Jesus as he initiates the new covenant are sort of like his first inaugural address, saying what he thinks God's new covenant is going to be about. Consider the lowly. God's watch over the remnant, the ones who prove to be the most faithful even as they are the lowliest in the social world, the most sinned against, and even the most faithful, although they are the lowest and the least. They are called the Anawim of God, and Zephaniah declares that they will be the firm foundation of the new Israel. The lowly. Being not so far from Christmas, we remember the hymns and the carols that we sang, and lots of them have the words low or lowly or loneliness in them. About 15, I was able to count quickly. But this is pure romance. Lowliness is not lovely and by itself does not confer holiness on anybody. The Old Testament story of the Babylonian captivity tells us that when the enemy conquered the nation and destroyed Jerusalem and carried off everybody and the treasures and all into captivity, they left the lowly behind to do what they could with the rubble in the cities and the decimated landscape. But the thing is, they were not even good enough to be slaves. That's lowliness. So who are the lowly in our world? Well, you know where not to go in your city. You don't want to be in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. In Jesus' times, the list was long, but here's some. Lepers, tax collectors, sinners, lepers. In our time, high school dropouts dealing drugs as their only source of cash. The neglected elderly, the men who live under bridges, the dumpster divers, and all over the world, refugees having left everything and fleeing from terror and ending up in a camp on the wrong side of a barbed wire fence. And all they have left is fading hope. And then there are Paul's beloved but exasperating Corinthian Christians who like to boast about their spiritual gifts and groups of the converted who were tussling with each other over which group was better or ranked higher. Paul tries to remind them that in Corinth, which is a pretty sophisticated and bustling city, these Corinthians are also among the lowly and are acting foolishly. But this is the way that God prefers it. So they, if they have gifts, have God and God alone to thank. And then come the Beatitudes, consoling and hopeful. Some of Jesus' first words about the new covenant. There are several lovely musical settings for the Beatitudes, which we sing and are inspired by and uplifted by. But if you strip away the music, I don't think you're going to be caught in what I again say might be romance. Without the harmonies and the uplifting lyrics, they're pretty stark. 
listen again. Now, you're one of the poor that's in Luke's gospel, or you're one of the poor in spirit of Matthew's gospel. And you are absolutely sure that this is no honor at all. And it is definitely something that no one should aspire to. Your spirit has also shriveled as you've spent a life of worry and scraping to feed your family. And there's simply nothing left in you that offers you the leisure to gather around the fire and sing or read to your children or find the time and means to celebrate the holidays well. I wonder how you would take the news of your blessedness. Here's my guess, eyebrows raised and mouth agape. You have to be kidding. Blessed? How dare you tell me your life is blessed? My life is blessed. I'm one of God's favored. I'm going to possess the kingdom of God. Listen, the only people who possess the kingdom of God around here are the rich. And then there's the Pharisees that stand at the door holding their Torahs <laughs> and keeping you out because they scorn you and think you're worth nothing. Blessed? Get over it. God hasn't been interested in us for years. And the mourners... You can talk about comfort, but does anyone really stop mourning the loss of a loved one? How can you comfort a widow whose spouse's death has torn her heart out? How can you comfort a mother who has watched her unborn babies be born dead, one after another? We have arms to embrace. We have food to bring over. But those are very small comforts, and they don't last. They want their loved ones back, and you can't do that for them. So where's the blessing? And the meek inherit the land? The powerless, the paupers like us? Our own rich Jews pull our tiny plots of land out from under us, and then in comes Caesar and his bullying troops. And if you say something or raise your voice, they'll run you through with a sword because everybody's so afraid that there's going to be a rebellion. Justice. There is no justice. It is, as the prophets have always said, no justice, no peace, no return of stolen goods or stolen lands, no payback for those who are swindled or preyed upon, like the widows or the orphans, no just judge that will hear us, no lawyer to stand by us. And where are those prophets with their promises? Why aren't they here now to preach about how God favors us and show us just how that is supposed to play out. Suffering people of every place and time are not likely to call themselves blessed. They find no shred of grace in their circumstances and the ill treatment that they bear. They live in fear and on the edge of despair. Their labors are hard their earnings are never enough to color the, cover the bills, to fill their hungry children, to pay the past due rent and to keep the lights on. The point is, I think, the Beatitudes are really not about happy people. One must be very cautious if suggesting to the discouraged and the hurting that they are, oh, so blessed, and God loves them oh so deeply because they're stuck in this lousy state of affairs. So the next question is, are the Beatitudes 
about us. Farther down the list, we can see work that we can aspire to, the mercy, the uprightness of heart, the peacemaking. And there's no doubt that we are inescapably called to stand up and be voices for the voiceless and to suffer for it. But what we can't allow ourselves to get stuck in is, as before, either romanticizing these pretty sayings or decide that they're like virtues to be worked on. You know, like asking yourself, well, I'm not really poor, but I could probably be more poor. Or how do I work on being more poor of spirit? Or how can I exercise meekness better? Or let's see, how, well, humility, that's, that's really a tough one. I am just so stuck on myself and so on. Instead, I think we have a different calling or drenching. It's baptism and it immerses us in beatitude. To me, this means that we are the ones seized by and sent by Christ Jesus and the Spirit as blessing, to be blessing, and to give blessing to those who can't see blessing anywhere. And we have to try to be a living word of God to them by witnessing as bearers of Christ's love or as Paul says, other Christs. There's a phrase used by the poor, and perhaps by some of my or your own ancestors, maybe during the Great Depression. When the resources are running out, when there's little left in the cupboards or the coffers, a woman will sigh, and then she'll stand up resolutely and she'll say, We'll just have to get by. We will just have to make do. This is exactly what God is about. What God has been up to for all eternity. Our great lover has by this mystery of incarnation and Jesus' victory over sin and death, erased the distance between us and between us and each other. And God has decided to get impossibly tangled up with humanity. And most mysterious of all, to include us in this immeasurable, magnificent work of salvation, sharing it with us, giving it to us. This divine project of enlisting human beings is more than chancy. It's divinely insane. We are absolutely not suitable for the honor or the job. We're always falling on our faces. We're always making promises we don't keep. We can behave so badly with each other. And after all these years, as history well shows, we still have not convinced the world of God's love and peace and justice. Why did God choose to make do with us? Has God run out of anything else? Catherine of Siena asked God straight out. Oh, mad lover, she says, and you have need of your creatures? You act as if you could not live without her. In spite of being the source of life itself, why then are you so mad? Because you have fallen in love with what you yourself have made. God seems, in Catherine's eyes, to be drunk with desire for her salvation. 
You clothed yourself in our humanity, she says, and nearer than that you could not have come. A drunken God might explain something. So today we're offered this glimpse into the mystery. God is making do by his covenant with humanity. It's his show, and we don't remember auditioning for it. We forget who we are and who we're supposed to be. But God is remarkably persistent, even though we, his human agents and carriers of the good news, are a little reluctant to speak out and kind of wish we'd have a chance to say no a little bit more louder. But God so loves the little ones, the poor ones, the sinned against, and the sinners, and yes, us, who are somewhere in there, but still have this commission. Be who you are. Be who God dreams you can be so that you can show Christ to them. There's nothing to do but stand in wonder at God's mad miracle of it all. And then get out there and begin to be blessing. After evening prayer, we Dominicans sing a hymn to St. Dominic. The last words we sing are these. Preacher of grace, Unite us with the blessed. I used to think we were referring to the saints in heaven. Now, not so much.